60 years ago today, the Brown versus Board of Education case was decided by the Supreme Court outlawing school segregation in the United States. Last night, First Lady Michelle Obama commemorated that anniversary by speaking to graduating high school seniors in Topeka, Kansas, the city where it all began. But eventually, these parents went to court to desegregate their children's schools because, as one of the children later explained as an adult, she said, we were talking about the principle of the thing. Now think about that for a moment. Those fat folks had to go all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States just to affirm the principle that black kids and white kids should be able to attend school together. To understand how the Supreme Court decided in a unanimous decision to end legal school segregation, first we need to meet the Clarks, Kenneth and his wife, Mimi Phipps. They were the first two African Americans to earn doctorates of psychology from Columbia University, and together, in the 1940s, they devised a series of experiments to find out how young children were impacted by racial segregation. In the most famous, known as the Doll Test, the Clarks offered African-American children between the ages of three and seven the choice between two dolls, a white doll and a brown doll. Most of the children chose the white doll as the one they wanted to play with, and most light labeled the white doll as nice and the black doll as bad. Kenneth Clark Included, quote, the Negro child accepts as early as six, seven, or eight the negative stereotypes about his own group. These children, like other human beings who are subjected to an obviously inferior status in the society in which they live, have been definitely harmed in the development of their personalities. It was this conclusion that helped convince the United States Supreme Court to strike down segregation in public schools 60 years ago today. Unanimous Court wrote in Brown v. Board of Education to separate school children from others of similar age and qualification solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. This finding is amply supported by modern authority. That modern authority included the Clark's research that led the court to conclude that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. That was 60 years ago today. For many years, things improved, thanks in part to strict federal enforcement and long-standing court orders. But today, segregation in our public schools remains, maybe even deepens. Consider that less than a quarter of African-American students now attend a mostly white school, according to a new report by the UCLA Civil Rights Project. In the South, schools have backslid to where they were in 1967. All progress towards integration since then has been erased. The fact is documented in vivid detail in Segregation Now, a recent ProPublica piece looking at the public schools in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. The piece focuses on Central High School, which is now more than 99% African American, the result of increasing segregation since the judge released the city from a court order to integrate, according to the piece. Now, the state of Alabama considers Central a failing school. 80% of students are not expected to go to college. 35% of its seniors fail to graduate each year. In other words, it's hard to see how Central's high students have benefited from the resegregation of their school. Joining me now from Portland, Oregon, is the author of that piece, ProPublica reporter Nicole Hannah-Jones. Nice to have you, Nicole. Thanks for having me. Okay, so one of the things that you broke in your Tuscaloosa story is about the existence of these secret deals in which African-American community leaders actually agree to a segregation plan, partly in order to keep white parents in the city school system. Help us to understand that. Well, before the court order desegregation, the Tuscaloosa city schools were majority white school system. And once they were actually forced to desegregate, like lots of cities across the South and really across the country, they experienced a great deal of white flight. And this really concerned city leadership. So they began kind of a, a series of secret meetings to try to figure out how to get released from that court order and then to be able to create kind of a cluster of schools where white students would be in the majority or at least close to it. And they knew that in order to do that, they were going to have to get the support of at least some prominent black officials in Tuscaloosa. Okay, so Nicole, we um, didn't talk to you, but talked about some of your reporting on housing a couple of weeks ago when we talked about um, the, the problems of housing integration and how once you get to a certain sort of tipping point, a neighborhood will move from being integrated to being basically all of, of the racial minority group. It feels to me like something similar is going on here with the schools, it, almost as though students of color reduce the property value as a way of putting it of their schools? 
Yeah, I mean, you could definitely say that. Um, I mean, you, you do need some historical context where the initial fight and the initial white flight was really in opposition to any black students mm -hmm. attending white schools. Um, and so that's what started it, but then it kind of becomes self-replicating. Mm -hmm. And so in the South, people tend to say that once a school becomes 70% black or a district becomes 70% black, it quickly uses, loses all of its white students. And that was the fear in Tuscaloosa. Um, by the time that the district was trying to get out from under its court order, it had gone from more than 60% white to less than 30% white. And they believe that the court order was the cause. All right, I, I want to pause for a moment, Nicole, and come out to my table. I've got some folks here at my panel that, that I also want both to give um, them an opportunity to, to ask you questions, but I also want to ask them um, a, a bit here. So, you know, here in New York is Judith Brown Dianas, who is co-director for the Advancement Project. Julian Vasquez Helig, who is the Associate Professor of Educational Policy and Planning at the University of Texas, Austin. Hallie Potter, who is Policy Associate for the Century Foundation. And Tremaine Lee, a national reporter for MSNBC.com. But I want to come to you, Julian, in part because I think it's, it's easy when we, when we start with Brown and then we go to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, to see this as a black-white issue. And in fact, our public schools are now a black-brown issue in many ways. Talk to me a little bit about how Nicole's findings in Tuscaloosa might also look similar or different than what you experienced in Texas. Sure. Well, one of the things we do know uh, from UCLA's work, Gary Orkin's work, is that California now, uh, Latinos are the most segregated in California. But we also have to think about, let's add to the issue, immigrant students and emergent bilingual students, which is these are students that are learning, learning English. And we find in a place like Texas that emergent bilinguals are what we call triple segregated. Not only are they segregated by race, but by class, they're also segregated into those students that are learning English. And, what, and we often talk about this demography determined destiny. What we know in Texas is that if you conduct the statistical analysis, you find that those schools that are triple segregated are more likely to be low performing. And this is a really big issue. All right, so let, so let me come back to you, Nicole, on exactly that, because if you're talking about community leaders actually cutting deals to keep certain kinds of kids and particularly certain kinds of parents in the public schools. And we know this demography as destiny, triple segregation problem. Is this, I mean, parents do have a right to vote with their feet by leaving the schools. Is this an insoluble segregation problem? Well, the, the issue is that the children who are being segregated are those who have kind of, who are the most vulnerable, who have the least cloud in the community. So in Tuscaloosa, there are no all white schools. Um, middle class black Americans are largely attending segregated schools in Tuscaloosa. What the gerrymandering of the attendance zones in Tuscaloosa did was create a feeder system that was entirely black and almost entirely poor. And these are people who are not going to be able to vote with their feet. That's why they live in a segregated part of town. Um, that's why they haven't been able to move into a neighborhood where they would be zoned into a better school. Yep. Nicole, your, your work, um, both your reporting on housing and on education, we just we read it like we eat like jelly beans around here. We love it. So thank you so much for joining us from Portland, Oregon this morning. The rest of my panel is staying with me. We have so much more on this 60th anniversary of Brown v. Board and the resegregation of America's schools. Stay with us because next we're going to hear what students in one of America's most segregated cities have to say about their schools. You talk about your school being relatively mixed. Um, and I know you might have a precise breakdown. I could probably find it, but um, um, what percentage do you think are white? I mean, are there a lot of white people? It's not, it's really not a lot of white people there. Maybe two, three, maybe two, three white people there.